being seen all over the world. Unmatched in fan size or their dedication. WWE is the number one sports channel on YouTube. Up, up, down, down. WWE game night. Playing dodgeball. This is Mixed Match Challenge on Facebook Watch. It's got to be too sweet. Mm. WWE has been a major topic in all forms of social media spreading worldwide. Ronda Rousey is here. 52 weeks a year, no off-season guarantee. We are everywhere, all the time. What's up, his Choice Award? WWE has the most powerful hit show on E. The always entertaining Total Divas and Total Bellas. The family. My wife is Marie. She is the missus. Get it? and missus. Let's yabba dabba do this. Uh, no, I'll pass, thanks. You should definitely tell them about the network. And you can see it all on WWE Network. WWE Network. WWE Network is the only place to see every live pay-per-view, including WrestleMania. WWE is all about putting smiles on people's faces. Don't be a bully. We made a commitment to help as many kids and their families. Together, we can all kick cancer's butt. Make a wish, grant a wish every 17 minutes. It takes more than magic. It takes muscle. Give me what you got. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, you guys ready to have some fun? I went out there, man, and I just got caught up. The energy in this place is unbelievable. They're everywhere, man. It's really? Heavy, heavy. Snickers satisfies. <laughs> I'm in awe of the incredible showmanship and athleticism. It is live theater. Michelle Wilson joined WWE in 2009 and has served as the Chief Revenue and Marketing Officer as well as, well as the EVP of Marketing. In February of 18, she was co-named President, Co-President and Director of WWE. Prior to WWE, Michelle was the Chief Marketing Officer of the United States Tennis Association. And prior to that, she oversaw all marketing efforts for the launch of the XFL Football League in partnership, a partnership between WWE and NBC. Prior to that, Michelle held positions at the MBA in Nabisco, and she graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. Okay, Ashley Elizabeth Flair performs for the SmackDown brand under the name Charlotte Flair. Um, she's a second generation professional wrestler as the daughter of two time Hall of Famer Ric Flair. Bet you're sick of that shadow. <laughs> in her team, she appeared with her father in World Championship Wrestling, and in 2012, she began, tra began training with the WWE, debuting with WWE's developmental brand called Next. Her rise to the top was rapid, and by 2014, she won the NXT Women's Championship. She was promoted to the main roster in 15, and in 16, she was crowned as the first WWE Women's Champion. <laughs> no tears. <laughs> Okay. To date, she's been a six-time champ. I'm sorry, I can't keep introducing you. You're too impressive. I'm going to go to questions and then I'll try to finish. No, put you in a headlock. <laughs> 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 exactly. Exactly. Okay. So um, when I think about, um, I mean, what's impressive about you is when you read your this resume of yours, 
it's actually first, 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 first. You have like 17 firsts. And as a woman who loves breaking glass ceilings, I have like one first. But you like have the 12 firsts, and you're like Well, we're in a male-dominated world, yeah, so I want to true. prove that true. the women are taking over. I, which I totally <laughs> love. Okay, so let me, um, let me like ask you the first question, and let's start with your path to WWE. Yeah. What led you to a career in sports entertainment, and, and how much influence has your father had? So I was telling them before I started talking, usually when I'm on stage, I woo. So in the back of my mind, I I'm woo? going, woo, because like, it's kind of what I do when, I, oh, I didn't know. when I'm okay. public speaking. Okay. So um, when you talk to someone who has a parent who's excelled at something that they're very passionate about, you would think that their children want to follow in their footsteps. However, I never thought that WWE would be in my future. I grew up playing sports. I ended up playing Division One volleyball at Appalachian State and then graduated from NC State, but it was my two brothers who wanted to be professional wrestlers. My little brother, Reed, uh, growing up, I mean, whenever he was home, he was playing uh, whatever pay-per-view was happening, Monday Night Nitro, because my dad was a part of WCW, and then when WWF, which is now WWE, he would never miss a show and just grew up wanting and idolizing my father, which if you know who my father is, the two-time Hall of Famer and 16-time World Heavyweight Champion, Ric Flair, that's some big shoes to fill. So in 2012, I'd already graduated college and I was just personal training. I was kind of lost. I didn't know what my future held, but I was in Miami for the Hall of Fame and I was sitting with my little brother, Reed, and my dad and a producer. His name is Johnny Laurinaitis and my brother, um, was suffering from addiction and I spent my entire 20s trying to save his life so in 2012 when I was sitting there with him obviously the dinner was about how could we get Reed into WWE how could he pass you know the wellness how could he just get out of the you know funk that he was in and continue this path of being you know a generational wrestler so Johnny Laurinaitis looked at me and was like why aren't you doing this and I was like what do you mean? Like, I never grew up wanting to be famous. I never, you know, I loved my dad. I loved going to his shows. I was his biggest cheerleader, but when I saw the women, that's not how I pictured myself. I mean, if you would have asked me six years ago, would I be sitting in front of you guys talking about the WWE and wanting to be the face of this company as a female, I would have said, no way. I was scared of my own shadow. So I said, well, you know what? Maybe, I don't know why, I'm, I mean, I know I'm athletic. I played Division One volleyball. I was a cheerleader. I was a gymnast. I played basketball, soccer, diving, even river dance. I don't even know if you guys know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not show you what I that say, is. Uh-oh, that's and I'm good pretty, information to have. No. <laughs> and I'm pretty <laughs> sure my mom made me play the piano in middle school, but I just, sports were my thing. So I said to myself, if I can get into the program, which is called NXT, our developmental system, maybe if they sign me, that would encourage my brother to stay clean. And uh, three months later, I showed up to Tampa not knowing anything about the business. Now, mind you, my father is Ric Flair, and into this industry, he means everything. I mean, he embodies professional wrestling. And I didn't know the lingo. I didn't know that there was a subculture. I knew nothing. All I knew was... John Cena made wishes come true. And my dad had the best music ever. So I get there in July in 2012, and uh, before my little brother ever got to see me wrestle, he overdosed and passed away. So I told myself that I would continue his dream, so it has nothing to do with my dad or continuing the Flair legacy. I thank my brother for opening the doors to a world that I had no idea I wanted to be a part of and if it wasn't for his dream I would not be sitting here today in front of you guys and like I said um, I'm a first for a lot of things and I will continue to continue my brother's legacy while continuing the flair legacy I love you dad but um, <laughs> it's all about my little brother Reed so he saved your life he saved my life yeah it's funny you spend so I thought you know how do I save his life? How do I save his life? And then ultimately he ended up saving mine. Oh, life's funny that way. Yeah. It is. So Michelle, first over the top media company 
first me, traditional media company transition linear TV to over the top. Thinking about your path to pivoting to over the top, how hard was it, and what were the biggest challenge in making the shift from linear to over the top? Yeah, if you talk about 2012, I think it was a, your start of um, your career at WWE, and Charlotte's clearly accomplished tremendous things in those six years. Interestingly, we were on, um, it was probably about 2012 when um, I, I came on board in 2009. One of my responsibilities that Vince gave me was running our um, infamous pay-per-view business. And um, much like Charlotte, I came from the NBA, I came from the world of tennis where um, the, the vernacular or even the business model of pay-per-view didn't exist. So of course when I was given the responsibility to run pay-per-view, I'm like, what is pay-per-view? I don't even understand how it works. And so the very first pay-per-view I ordered was um, Royal Rumble in 2009. And I said, well, people pay you know, $55, $60 for this. Um, and it's almost was almost a good thing that I didn't have too much knowledge about what the traditional business model was for WWE. So one of the things I would constantly ask Vince is, you know, this is the most valuable WWE content happens on this pay-per-view platform, and yet um, it's priced, you know, relatively expensively. Um, and again, we're still in business with our partners and we love them. But as a consumer, you know, ordering on a remote and kind of the whole experience, I was like, well, how many of our fans are really watching pay-per-view? Our best content wasn't getting out there. So it really started this journey in 2012 of, of George Barrios, CFO, and who's co-president with me, of us really challenging and asking Vince, you know, what, what do we need to be doing? What's kind of the next level for us? And the natural progress or the natural course was, well, let's launch a network like everybody else has. Let's launch a traditional linear ad-supported network. And that was really the journey that we went on. Yeah. The hard part was really the research and really digging deeper beyond kind of the traditional path, which I think Vince has been notorious for not just doing the traditional, but really looking at the future and what, li what was lying ahead. And so we did a, a lot of research. And what the research told us was that while a traditional ad-supported network might be logical, our WWE fans at the time were consuming five times as much content on digital platforms. They were on YouTube, they were Netflix subscribers, they were Hulu subscribers, and in 2012 that was pretty unheard of, but they were five times more likely to be consuming content that way. So for us it was, light bulb went off. It was like, well, if that's the future, maybe that's the path that we should be going down. Now, the difficult part of it, your question being what was difficult, everything was difficult because there was literally, you know, there was no playbook for what we were doing other than Netflix and Hulu, which were video companies that started in that business. They weren't transforming a legacy pay-per-view business. They weren't in the linear television business. So for us, we were really going into uncharted territory. There were, there were no um, other companies we could really look at and say, hey, this is how they did it, this is who they partnered with, this is what you're going to have to be prepared for. There was none of that. So it was, you know, um, George, myself, our team, and Vince really trying to figure out where to go. And so I would say not, having the, not knowing what to do. So the, the very first thing were all of the conversations for any companies who are trying to launch now you know, what is the value proposition? What content will go there? And how are you going to price it? I mean, those were the things that we spent the most time talking about. Yeah. And figuring that out and making sure that it was right for our fan base was really what we spent our time on. And again, we didn't have a crystal ball to say this was the right answer, but we made that decision to say, you know, 999 was a logical price point. We created chance around it. Maybe not quite as popular as the woo, but you know, our fans were chanting 999 and they understood that the best content that we created, it was a new tier. It was available at an affordable price on the WWE Network. So again, having the right proposition was really what we spent our most time on initially in the first phase. And again, it was, was not easy. It was a lot of long debates without a playbook. Well, and one of the things about digital is they get to market fast and then they iterate. You guys did by what I would call the old media world, which is you figure it all out ahead of time, which costs you extra time. But you really haven't iterated. It's been 9.99 the whole time. You keep adding more library content to the to the mix and more original content. Exactly. But but I think I would guess that was in the playbook right when you launched. Correct. Like probably it isn't that iterative other than maybe the type of content you're making is now more focus based on what the data you're getting is more data analysts for sure yeah we've gotten obviously I mean that was one of the um, probably the other challenges was being prepared for the data side yeah. of what this brought to all of us is at WWE's we had 
one, literally one data scientist when we launched the WWE Network, and now we had all this data coming in. If you fast forward, we now have a team of over 30 data scientists that help us understand what are the subscribers watching, how do we target them, how do we segment them, what, how do we recommend other programming. So the data has certainly um, changed how we market and how we promote the network. But yes, I mean, we one of the things that I think WWE is great about is consistency in our yep. business strategy, yep. consistency in how we communicate to our fan base. So we feel um, until our entire kind of available market who could buy the WWE network understands what it is and understands the price point, it's mm -hmm. better to keep it simple. Yeah, rather than iterating. So Charlotte, back to you. Can you tell us what the typical day in the life of a WWE superstar and what is the hardest part of becoming a WWE superstar? The typical day in the life. And don't make me cry this time. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. The superstars are usually on the road 300 plus days a year. I typically fly out, say I'm on the Raw brand. We have, well, we have three brands. We have Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. Raw and SmackDown travel worldwide. So if you're on Raw, you typically fly out on a Friday. You fly to whatever city is having that live event. You perform Friday in that city, Saturday, Sunday, and you go live on Monday. And then if you have an appearance, you fly to the appearance on Tuesday. Maybe you fly home for those two days. Maybe you don't, or you fly to that next live event. For instance, Raw is in the UK right now. I think SmackDown is still in Germany. So when I leave here, I'll be flying back to Germany. But when you land in the city, you typically find a gym, you find a grocery store, and then you go to call time at 5.30, you perform, and then you drive anywhere between 60 and 300 miles to the next town, and you do it all over again. On top of that, you're on the phone uh, talking to media. Um, whether you're on Monday or Tuesday, you might be waking up early to do local media, news stations, radio stations, or conferences like this. I'm honored to be here. Yesterday, we hosted the NBC Universal Upfront, where three of us presented WWE and what we're all about. Uh, it, the sky's the limit for what we're capable of. We even, you know, I've taken off to film the Psych movie last summer, so I was off of SmackDown for a month. So at any day, you're doing something really, and I... We don't let it, them rest very often. No. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a 40-hour Yeah, week. we don't let them rest. It's crazy, but it's energizing. Like, now when I go home for a day, I'm like, what do I do? Uh, <laughs> I'm bored. Please, I don't know. I'm bored, but, you know, my window's small, but uh, it's amazing. It's really immersive. It's 52 day weeks a year, right? Yep. You don't get yeah. two weeks off, like or unless you're injured. But that's yeah. what okay. makes. I mean, okay. you don't want to be injured. Knock on wood. Yeah, but no. that's what's so special about the WWE is where the show goes on, whether you're there or not. We're having a live event with two brands in four different cities, and we go live Monday, we go live Tuesday, and then say you're in a pay-per-view with the largest Royal Rumble in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. uh, no, where was it? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Saudi, 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 yeah. Saudi. Last month. I mean, it's crazy. Yep. Okay. And so, and tell me about work. When do you fit in your workouts? Because presumably you're working out every day. Do I have that right? So for me, working out, I look at it as part of the job. If the fans or the WWE Universe see me investing in myself, uh, I find that they will invest in me more. Okay. So I have a trainer that follows me on the road. Not He doesn't follow me on the road, but he tracks my workouts. And then I send them what I do that day. Typically, I find a CrossFit gym. And okay. I have that hour, and then I have a dietitian that works with me because to stay we in peak <laughs> shape 300 days a year is a struggle. That is not natural. Um, and then learning to eat on the road. But you find a routine. For me, it took about a year to get used to the travel and the flights and the wrestling. But, you know, this is what I want to do. So. so the hardest part is the travel? Or the no, diet? it's speaking in front of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really hard to I hear the <laughs> girlfriend. Talking a million miles per hour. No, you, I mean, <laughs> it's part of, it's evolving. Okay. So, it, uh, you know, at first I thought, you know, oh, I'm just a wrestler. And then, no, I'm, I'm more than a wrestler. I'm a superstar. And then having the opportunity to grow with the company and learn, you know, about public speaking. And then there's, you know, movies and outlets. It's just, growing yeah, yeah. with the process. It's sort of you grow with it, with your opportunities. Absolutely. It a lot of doors. That's super cool. One of the things I'll add yeah. that Charlotte does yeah. that 
Um, Charlotte was, you know, all of our talent are incredibly um, savvy about the business they want to learn. As Charlotte mentioned, she didn't know a lot about it. Um, Charlotte actually reached out to me what was probably six or seven months ago. October. Um, and I give her a ton of credit saying, you know, what else can I do um, to grow my brand, the Charlotte Flair brand? And I, I give my you know, hats off to her and I told her that. I'm like, you know, good for you. I was terrified, being... by the way. You just don't... <laughs> email Michelle. So I was like, <laughs> I don't know if this is okay, but and I want to be larger what than life. What do I need to do? And it's the great thing about our business model, knowing that all of our talent work with us. Um, her question was, you know, how do I grow my brand? And one of the other things that we helped um, Charlotte on is, is digital and social media. So in addition to everything else that our talent do, is they're part of our storyline and part of engaging with our fan base and storytelling. And we had a great, um, we've been working very closely with Charlotte for the past six months on, you know, what to share on social media. How do you engage fans more? Um, what does she want her brand to be, to be a role model to girls? Um, doing community outreach, you know, who, what community partners does she want to align herself with? So in her, like, three minutes of spare time, our talent are also continuing to tell the story on digital and social, which we know is such an important part of what we do. And Charlotte has really become a, a student of how to be even better at that. And we've seen her number. It's growing. I mean, we gave her some tips, and just in the last couple of months, her engagement levels and followers have grown dramatically just by, you know, giving the fans what else they want to know about Charlotte as a human being when she's not in the ring, and it's been a great success. And story. adding to that, that's what's been great about the network. We've realized that our fans really want to know more about who is Charlotte. So, open. I mean, lifting that curtain and saying, hey, I'm Ashley, this is what I do on my off days. You know, does your dad train you? I that's mean, what they want to know. That's what they want to know. So on the network, it's for the first time the audience gets to know us as people, and that's really unheard of. Like, I used to get asked the question, is wrestling real or fake? I'm like, no, it's real. I got my teeth knocked out last week. <laughs> but, you did for real. No, I did for real. Um, <laughs> so I was feeling I wasn't going to make it here today. But that's the challenge with social media is playing this character that's larger than life, but also saying, like, no, I'm Ashley, and when I'm home, I'm eating pizza with my niece and nephew and that's what the audience gravitates to. Yep. Well, I think, I, I think that it's part of solidifying your brand, but it's also, it hyper, uh, makes your reach much more, more exactly. much Absolutely. really hyper. And we've already seen it. It's it yeah. kind of, um, your it, impact. It, it really it, helps your it impact. It does. It well. becomes a catalyst for her continued growth for our brand, for Charlotte's brand. And again, we've already seen, you, that's the great thing about digital and social. You can see the results right away. We gave her some advice and overnight her followers increased, the engagement level. So again, it just adds another layer for, for all of us to continue to grow. So and that sort of builds on my second question for you because when you started here really WWE was a regional wrestling brand I mean I guess when Vince started it was really regional but even when you got here it was a much smaller footprint or impact level than it is today and you've really worked um, it's really on your shoulders you've turned it into a global sort of media and entertainment super brand superpower brand so can you share how you did this and how public perception of WWE has changed over time yes um, and it's a, a great story when I um, came back to talk to Vince about joining, rejoining WWE in 2009. That was really um, one of the questions is that people knew of WWE, but as a brand and being a brand person, um, you know, there were a lot of um, misperceptions about the brand. And, and in 2008, the brand had segued to becoming TV PG or family friendly, and that was really repositioning the brand. And when Vince, when I came to interview with Vince, he told me that, and I said, wow, you know, I did not even know that. That's, that's a really well-kept secret that we need to change. <laughs> and so, you know, we really started on this great journey, and that was really one of the reasons that I, I came back to work for Vince was this great opportunity to educate the marketplace and grow the brand and tell the story of WWE, the scale, the storytelling, the history, the legacy. Um, but people didn't know, even in the, in the business community. So we started literally on this journey that began in 2009, and I would say it was really initially a, a B2B effort. It was, it was conferences like this. It was getting partners like NBC Universal to tell the story of WWE because, again, there were a lot of misperceptions about our brand. They didn't know that we were, you know, now number one on YouTube. They didn't understand the social media following that we were building. They didn't realize the rich history of storytelling that we're like a movie, we're like a TV show. So we, um, it was a lot of little things that we've done right um, ourselves, kind of going out to the marketplace and to decision makers, to conferences like this. 
Um, and then it was it was really um, a lot of marketing on our part about the characters that we have in the ring, the stories that we're telling, having John Cena out there doing Make-A-Wish, um, having NBC Universal, like yesterday, at the upfronts telling the advertising community about WWE. All of those things over the last you know, eight or nine years have added up to a much greater understanding and awareness of our brand. I think our fans always knew it. Our fans have always been there. But I don't know that decision makers necessarily knew who we were. Advertisers, which again, we've made tremendous strides on the advertising front, educating them about who we are. And there's no other brand. Um, you know, we have more viewership than the NBA and regular, more viewership than any sport. They're like, wow, we didn't know that other than the NFL. So once they understood the power of our brand and the how you could connect with our audience, we've added, I mean, we have a roster of 200 advertisers now on um, USA Network, and that was not where we were eight or nine years ago. Well, staying on advertisers, you have these big global sponsorships, which is really driving a lot of revenue growth, 30% growth in that. Yes. Those are global sponsors. So you've actually turned it into sort of global because you sort of hone in on why it's now globally like accepted, I guess. Yeah. And I, I, Again, we've it's taken a lot of work with ad agencies and brands to educate them. But again, when they look at the numbers of the global reach, I mean, you saw in the video, we had, we're closing in on one billion social media followers around the world. So if you're a brand like Snickers or you're a brand like um, uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola and you're looking for targeted engagement but that also gets you scale and can attach your brand to that, yeah. there aren't a lot of brands out there that can do it on a global basis. So again... WWE is pretty easy to understand, even though there's a lot of nuances to what we do. There's a good guy and there's a bad guy. Somebody loses, somebody wins. It's not like American football, which I love football. I grew up watching it, but I try to explain it to my friends outside of the U.S., and they're like, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, we're pretty easy to understand. So from a brand storytelling perspective, brands have found that we're great to partner with. Well, and I think this notion that I think Vince said it on the last call, when you put a ring in the middle of the room, everyone knows what's about to happen. Exactly. So it travels globally. <laughs> they don't have to explain cricket rules. Yeah, conflict resolution is pretty straightforward. Yeah, right. So yeah. you guys are going to get in that ring and fight. Oh, it's four. Okay, fine. Yeah. Like, you know what's going to happen. Exactly. Charlotte, let's go back to you. Um, how does Ronda Rousey coming to WWE change your world? It changes everything. Oh. To th well, to think that when she was main eventing UFC, the first woman ever, to think that women could do that in the WWE was unheard of. And her interest in our women's division lets us know that we've made an impact not only to our audience, but to mainstream superstars or uh, athletes, Olympic medalists, and that she wanted to be a part of our division. And I'm, you know, Anything that brings more eyes on the women in WWE is positive. So to think that you know, Ronda's already made a name for herself and having her be a part of what we do, it, I mean, it just makes it that much more special, makes it that much more real. And to think that this legitimate UFC fighter, when people might not know, is wrestling real or is it fake? And then it, the, both worlds meet, uh, who knows what's, you know, it's capable the athletic credential absolutely. of WWE. It's not just performance art. It's there's some badasses absolutely <laughs> running around this place. Yeah, yeah. So when you go, when you think of the WWE Performance Center, I am what you call WWE homegrown talent. What I mean by that is we have this state-of-the-art training facility slash second part Hollywood back lot. So when I first showed up at NXT. I had no idea how to do my makeup, I had no idea how to wrestle, I had no idea how to perform, to act, to be a character, and everything that you need to be calm is available at that performance center. So when I first started, because I played sports, it was easy to run the ropes and be physical and excel in the weight room, but I was like, how am I going to do my makeup, how am I going to come up with a character, I'm being told that I can't woo. I can't do anything like my dad. That's your dad. Yeah. You won't, so now, like, I woo, I have his music, I wear a robe. But at first, they were like, you can be nothing like your dad. So I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't know. That's the only thing I really know about wrestling. So at the Performance Center, uh, you go six days a week, and there's seven different rings. And in each ring, depending on what class you're in, depending 
you know, what level you're at, you have a different coach, and then to work on a character, you have promo class, or what you would call acting class, and we have the availability upstairs on these computer, computers to watch your match back and then meet with the trainers to excel, and then, you know, hopefully one day the goal is to make it to the main roster. And at Performance Center now, we have this third brand, NXT, where you, you actually are on NXT programming now, which is only on the WWE Network, which makes the WWE Network, you know, like you said, special with new content because it's new shows, and then you might see the future superstars who you see mainstreaming on Raw, SmackDown, or our major pay-per-views. And not most of our talent are either athletes who or wrestlers who've trained all over the world on the independents but for myself i actually they groomed me from day one having no experience and that's all available at our performance center right. and i think well, and i think these the nxt lets people vote like the more a player on nxt gets voted the more likely they are to come into the big room more, more on social media so, yeah oh, so social, social media social oh okay that was one show we did it was okay. a reality show we did but then now it's yeah. really based just on social media social media and yeah. who's developing and now i okay. i believe it's um i at wrestlemania as an example what the the system that charlotte's referring to we didn't have that prior to 2010 we, we would just kind of, you know, haphazardly find talent or talent would find us. Now this is, you know, obviously a, a, a process that we go through. And right now on WrestleMania, just this past WrestleMania, 70% of the talent that performed at WrestleMania came through that system. So it's proving that it, it's working and that Paul Levesque, Triple H, who was his brainchild of, of creating this developmental system, is a process for us to continue to create great WWE superstars. So it is absolutely working for us. Questions from the audience before I go to my next question. No, okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, back to you. Um, so tell us about the 10-year deal with, with Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. None yeah. of us saw that coming. No, And no. is Charlotte going to get to be on stage in Saudi Arabia in the you next know. decade? I certainly hope so. That would be awesome. I certainly hope so. I'm, that would I mean, change the world right I there. I certainly hope so. I mean, That would be enough to do in one lifetime. I Show up so. in Saudi Arabia. I have no doubt. Yeah, I, it is on our roadmap, put okay, it that way. Um, yeah, so it's, for those of you who aren't aware, we announced a, about a month and a half ago a deal with the General Sports Authority of Saudi Arabia, a 10-year deal um, to bring WWE to the Middle East, to that region. And uh, most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with Vision 2030, which is uh, the pr Crown Prince's plan to um, have their economy not so reliant on oil, and entertainment is one of the things that, were, that they were looking at. So, you know, I know Laura would grill us five years ago, why are you guys doing this social media thing? Is it ever going to pay off? Like, where's the money? Yeah, where's I'm like, I love to tell her, all right, here it is, Laura, here's proof. So in the Middle East, um, we rely, I mean, we had longstanding partners with um, OSN and NBC on television, but our real fan base in the Middle East was really on digital and social, um, Saudi Arabia being one of the biggest markets. So as the General Sports Authority of Saudi Arabia was saying, what do we want to bring to Saudi Arabia to open up the world? WWE was on the top of the list, which is really interesting based on our fellowship. So it's, it's a 10-year agreement. We're um, obviously very excited about it. We just did our first event there and sold out a soccer stadium, which was you know, over 40,000, 50,000 in attendance. It was an amazing success. We happened to do it three weeks right after WrestleMania. So there are the, you know, the challenges around pulling off something of that scale. Um, there's, it's amazing what Did WWE it drive can do. Over the top subscribers? Um, it, it was available in the region on free television, and then outside of the U.S., yes, it, we were available on the WWE network, and we saw new subscribers come in specifically to see this, okay. the greatest Royal Rumble in Saudi Arabia. Okay. So a great success for us. Um, certainly on the on the female front, you know, we obviously have to be respectful of the culture there. I'll be making a trip there myself in a, in a month or so to continue our discussion on our partnership. But we do believe that um, you can sit on the sideline of things like that or you can hopefully be part of the change. So absolutely we have conversations with them about um, female performers at some point in the future while still respecting their culture. So we do hope to see that come to fruition. i got to see your costume for that. That is going to be one heck of a yeah. line to, to walk You'll there. Be wrestling, yes, yeah, you're her wrestling costume for yes. that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to do one more question. Let me do, direct this to uh, Charlotte. Um, so, um, so what goal have not, haven't you reached at WWE yet that you still want to get done? I want a main event WrestleMania. 
when I, I, I thought you already do not. I'm all main for event. that. I no. thought I, when I was in the store, I thought it was, the main event was you versus. Not for WrestleMania. No. Women have not main evented no, yet at okay. WrestleMania. I didn't yeah. know that distinction. Yeah. So when I first okay. started wrestling, my dad told me that a woman would never main event a pay-per-view. And it wasn't my dad, I mean, trying to encourage me, you know, work really hard and these things will happen. Uh, but now the women have gone on to main event Raw, SmackDown. I was in the first ever Hell in a Cell, main evented that pay-per-view, which every man in the company probably said that would never happen. Right. And then we actually sold the show at WrestleMania 32 in front of 101,000 people at AT&T Stadium. And I personally think Oscar and I had the best match at <laughs> WrestleMania. Yeah, and this is my favorite. Um, last year, or this year. But um, no, I want a main event WrestleMania. And I think with Ronda's star power and how the women are ever evolving and that we, you know, since we're no longer divas and we're superstars, that'll happen. And do, you, do you see it in the data? Do you see it in the over-the-top yeah, data, absolutely. the viewing? What's the viewing? Well, I mean, we see it from data. Forget over-the-top, we see it in linear television. Do when you? we look at our minute-by-minute -minute ratings in Raw and SmackDown, really? um, that's really how this all started is the, the women's matches as we were developing these huh. great athletes and great entertainers. All of our viewers wanted to see more of the women's matches, so we would look at the rating, the minute by minute rating, and you would see them go up when the women were performing. So, so again, the data is there um, on all of the uh, digital data. A lot of women are watching and following our product, but it's men and women. They both, uh, you know, it's, it's, they both enjoy what the women are. Well, I think doing. that is the point that women will all watch the women, and some men will watch, but a this lot of is, women won't watch the men. Yeah. So, so you end up with bigger. Yep. And by the way, I like talk to like ten people online waiting my hour to buy my stuff, and every man said that. He prefers the women's stuff, yeah. and every girlfriend because says she we have prefers something to prove. Like if you went back and watched, we were in the first ever women's Royal Rumble this past year, and a lot of the guys were like, "Wow, the women's match was better than the men's match because <laughs> it, it's the first ever." So if we don't, I guess, overperform yeah, or over deliver, it's like, well, we only have a one shot in a male-dominated world. There's only so many women in this company, and that's. And they keep delivering. That's what we want. And we keep, keep delivering. delivering. Okay, so here's what happens next. They have an extra 20 minutes, but we can't stay in this room. So we are, anyone in this room is invited to a room at the far end. It's our own conference room. And for 20 minutes, they can answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. You can take pictures with the magnificent you duo here. Charlotte. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And we're just going to go to a room directly across at the far end right. for 20 minutes. Thank you for but having us. But we need to leave this room. Thank you. Thank you.